Thank you all for gathering here this evening, and thank you all for your interest and support in, uh, of, of our beautiful church. Uh, you see a lot of familiar faces here, and uh, I just, just want to thank you for, for what you do as faithful followers of Jesus Christ. I have the privilege of introducing our speaker this evening, Dr. John Cavadini. He is a professor of theology at the University of Notre Dame, having served as the chair of the theology department from 1997 to 2010. Since the year 2000, he has served as the director of the McGrath Institute for Church Life at Notre Dame. He received his Bachelor of Arts in 1975 from Wesleyan University, a Master of Arts in 1979 from Marquette University, uh, and uh, a Master's in Philosophy in 1991, and, or 1983, excuse me, and his PhD in 1988 from Yale. As a member of the Notre Dame faculty since 1990, Dr. Cavadini teaches studies and publishes in patristic and early medieval theology, the theology of St. Augustine, and the history of biblical and patristic exegesis. He has served a five-year term on the International Theological Commission. He was appointed to that commission by Pope Benedict XVI. Uh, his list of publications uh, seems almost endless, and he has uh, been a very fine contributor to uh, the life of the church. On a, a personal note, I've had the privilege of meeting him and working with him through the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops Committee on Doctrine, of which I am a member and of which Dr. Cavadini serves as one of our theological consultants. Dr. Cavadini is a dedicated man of faith, and I think also very importantly, a very devoted husband, father, and grandfather. And so I have the privilege of introducing to you a great man of the church, Dr. Cavadini. Hi, everyone. Thank you for that very generous introduction. So, friends, thanks for coming. I wanted to spend you know, our, our time together this evening reflecting on the mystery of the church. <clears throat> I think at a time such as we're living through, a difficult time of scandal, etc., I think it's always important to kind of uh, take a step back, kind of go back to basics. What is the Catholic theology of the church? What is the mystery of the church? And I think if we have a kind of growing or deep, deeper appreciation of that theology and of that mystery, I think that it becomes easier despite a lot of the, um, a lot of the scandals that are afflicting the church right now to love the church. So really, my sort of, uh, the question I want to answer, I think, in the lecture, is on what basis do we love the church? Why do we love the church? We can love the church for a lot of different reasons, for the people that come to the church, for the example of the saints, for the sacraments, etc. But what's the theology underlying all of that that can help us, can increase our appreciation for the church, for the mystery of the church, and thereby nourish our love of the church? So that's my thought. And I thought I'd spend about 40 minutes talking and then allow time for, for questions and answers or any, on any, on, on this subject, or any subject, if you like, well, theological subject. I can talk about other things in an unlearned way. So friends, there's a handout. Um, I'm sorry that the print is so small. <laughs> It's only passages from the Catechism of the Bible, but I thought you might like to follow along. I'd like to start not on the first page. I'm going to go back to the first page. 
I'd like to start out with be the third page. Passage from the Catechism number 760. Ready? Here we go. Christians of the first centuries said, the world was created for the sake of the church. God created the world for the sake of communion with his divine life, a communion brought about by the convocation of men in Christ. And this convocation is the church. The church is the goal of all things. And God permitted such painful upheavals as the angels fall and man sin only as occasions and means for displaying all the power of his arm and the whole measure of the love he wanted to give the world. <coughs> Just as God's will is creation and is called the world, so his intention is the salvation of man and is called the church. So friends, that, um, that sentence that says Christians of the first century said the world was created for the sake of the church, that comes from a very ancient document called the Shepherd of late 1st century document or early 2nd century. So it's very ancient. It actually almost made it into the canon of scripture. Uh, but it didn't. But it came close. And so it's a, it's a very ancient tradition. But I think it's shocking, actually. Maybe it's not too shocking. But I think to my students, anyway, when I read it to them, it's shocking. Like, what do you mean? Yeah, the world was created for the sake of the church. How could you even, how could you begin to think that? Look at the church and all the scandals and everything. How is the world created for the sake of the church? And to make matters worse, it says later, the church is the goal of all things. How can that be true? It sounds hopelessly triumphalistic. Why the church? Why do we talk this way? Sometimes I think it was God's God's foresight to include it in this first century document in order when it was quoted in the 20th century, it could shock the Catholics who read it. That's my sense of humor, friends. My students tell me I don't have a sense of humor. It's not really true. I just don't have an efficacious sense of humor. I have one. Anyway. So, I think I'd like to take as my I guess you could say subtext, uh, and a, a, the challenge of explaining that sentence. The world was created for the sake of the church, and making sense of it. So I'm going to go back to it, but I wanted to put it up there at the outset as the kind of bar I'd like to reach. I don't know if that shocked anybody. Right does shock my students. So friends, I want to begin after that, second step, by talking about what I think is kind of the default mode in the back of Catholics' minds when they think of the church. What is the church? I think even I have this in the back of my mind somewhere. Somewhere. Uh, I know it isn't true. But it's hard, it's hard to resist it. It's very seductive. It's this. We, I think in the back of my mind subconsciously, the church is a kind of club. The church is a place which is, by a club, I mean a group, an association of people, which is constituted primarily by the will of the people in the group to come together and form a group. And so something like the Elks Club. The Elks Club is a, is a club, right? And the Elks Club is formed by the will of the, of the, of, of the people, the Elks, to come together, form a group, and do interesting things together. They have a lot of interesting things to do. They have a lot of depth really cool titles. I forget what they are, they're entitled. It's a hierarchical organization. And they have cool costumes. Um, they do charitable works. It's a fraternal organization. I'm 
not making fun of the Elks Club. I'm actually indebted to the Elks Club of South Bend because I started a swim team once, a kid's swim team. Advice to all parents, never do this. <laughs> because not only is it a lot of work, but the other swim teams in town get jealous of you. And they try to block you out of pool time. But the Elks Club let us have their pool. So I'm dead. I'm not planning on having fun. My point is, the Elks Club, there's, there's no mystery to it. That is, as far as you look, as far down as you go, it's resolved to the will of the Elks to come together. And the same thing with the United States of America, in a way. It's, it's like a club, in that sense. It's formed by the will, it's constituted by the will of the people to get together, right? We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, to provide for the common defense, and do other cool things together, do hereby, I don't remember the rest of it, right? So the point is, when you bump into the United States, you bump into the will of the people to constitute themselves, and nothing more, nothing less, but nothing more. And I think it's, it's very tempting to think of the church the same way, especially since we have the phrase, people of God. And we tend to, I think, in some ways, in the back of our minds, elide that with we the people. So we tend to think the people of God is the group of people who come together and do some very special stuff together, very holy things. We come together, we sing hymns together, some of them very beautiful, some of them not so beautiful. Um, yeah, well, some of them not that edifying, but some of them very edifying. You have great ones in your head home that Bishop Dorfman created. But also to encourage each other in faith, to read the scriptures, to hear a, um, a homily, to celebrate a sacred meal, a very, very sacred meal, but we have the recipe. So, the church is kind of the sum of these activities and the will of us to get together to do them. But it's no more than that in this sort of caricature, which I think we all carry with us. And if we, we have this sort of caricature of the church, in our minds or in our imaginations or in the back of our minds, it's very difficult to understand why you would love the church more than you would love any other civic organization, for example. There's a lot of good civic organizations. Why wouldn't you love the Elks Club just as much? If it's for the people that you see, if it's for doing things together, why not the Elks Club? Why not any other club? There are a lot, maybe more glamorous ones. Why the Catholic Church? Why not an evangelical church, for example? Evangelical churches seem to have more entertainment. They seem to be more hospitable, quote unquote, people say. So why not love that as much as the church? And in fact, although it's something of a caricature, so I don't deal with characters, but still, that view of the church is kind of evangelical in a way, where the important stuff between, between um, the believer and God happens individually. So I receive Jesus as my personal Savior, and that's the moment I'm saved. If all of us who've had that experience want to come together, celebrate it and encourage each other in it, making a church, we can. But that's not the essential part. The essential part is an individual one-on-one. -on -one. And we come together to celebrate that in an organization which we basically create ourselves. And you, you might notice that in a lot of the evangelical world, the word, the word church is even dropping out. So you find worship centers. Anyway, it's a very American, I think, approach.
church because it relies on a kind of individual individualism, but then a coming together which we create. And it's also very seductive. Okay, so, that's the kind of, I think, caricature many of us, including myself, have to work against. So now, what's the, what's the actual theology of the church? I'm going to sum it up in one word, and then try to explain it. The church is a mystery. There's no mystery about the United States of America. There's no mystery about the Elks Club. But the church is a mystery. And as such, it's an article of faith, right? I believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We kind of pass that over in the creed very quickly. And we actually forget maybe we're making a faith statement that the church is something we believe in as an article of faith. It's not, it's not the same as Amtrak. I don't know why that came up. Like Amtrak, I believe in Amtrak. You don't really have to believe in Amtrak, right? What you see is what you get. So, <laughs> with the church, though, it's not entirely reducible to what you see, though what you see is important. Okay, so, next step. First step was the world was created for the sake of the church. We're going to circle back to that. The second step was to think about this caricature of the church that I call the club theology, or the we the people theology of the church. And now the third step is going to be a scriptural meditation. Because, friends, if you if you want to do any work in theology of the church, the Catholic theology of the church, you have to open your imagination because the theology of the church, as Catholics understand it, is carried largely in images. Not just in concepts, but in images. And these images are contained in scripture. And so I want to, and I think if you're going to, if you're going to overcome the rationalism of what I call the we the people theology of the church. You have to be willing to take a step back. I'll demonstrate. <laughs> That's what my students are talking about. <laughs> you don't have a step. You have to take a step back, though, seriously, and open our, open our hearts to the imagery that the Bible presents, and I'm going to concentrate on one image, which is used in the Gospel of John. So let's take this as a kind of scriptural intro to, a, to think about an image that carries the mystery of the church, and then we can think more about that mystery conceptually, okay? All right, so, the scripture passage I have in mind, there are two of them. They're right on the handout if you read. Sorry, it's so small. I saw somebody keep doing it without it. Okay. So, friends, these are familiar passages. The first one is the wedding feast of Cain. On the third day, there was a marriage of Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was Jesus was also invited to the marriage with his disciples. When the wine failed, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, O woman, what have you to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. <laughs> now six stone jars were standing there, for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and 
take it to the steward of the feast. So they took it. When the steward of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first. When men have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did in Canaan and Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So, friends, it's a very elegant, beautiful story. In, in the Synoptic Gospels, <clears throat> Jesus tells his disciples that the, the kingdom of God is like a wedding feast. And in a way, in this passage, what Jesus has done is turned the actual wedding feast into a sign of the kingdom by changing the water into wine there. It's very beautiful. And it's not just any old wine, right? It's really good wine. It's wine spectator wine liquor wine. <laughs> And his mother is, is very involved also. You'll notice the Gospel of John trades in irony. Who is the bridegroom? He's not named. The steward of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, it's left to your imagination to wonder who the bridegroom is. But as the Gospel of John develops, you might be that John the Baptist, in chapter 3 coming up, calls Jesus the bride. So the wedding feast at Cana deepens in significance as the gospel develops. Because the wedding feast at Cana points to the identity of Jesus as the true bride. And then later on in the gospel, all right. Jesus is the vine. He calls himself the vine. And we're the branches. In a sense, he's the origin of that vine. So the wedding feast at Cana sets up a trajectory in the gospel that comes to its fulfillment in chapter 19 at the Passion of Let's look at that. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and made four parts, one for each soldier. But the tunic was without seam, woven from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They parted my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did this. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, and his mother's sister Mary, wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother, and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. The bowl of vinegar stood there. So they put a sponge full of the vinegar on hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, in order to prevent the bodies from remaining on the cross on the Sabbath. For that Sabbath was a high day. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. And at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness.
testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place, that the scripture might be fulfilled, not a bone shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. So friends, a very familiar and very beautiful passage, and very poignant also. It's interesting to think about the correspondence between the wedding feast of Cana, that passage, and this one. The evangelist invites us to think about the correspondence. He set it up to attract our attention. So these are the only two places in the Gospel of John where Jesus speaks to his mother. And it's the only place in the Gospel where Jesus himself refers to her as his mother. Because apparently her hour has come also, just as his hour has come. And the fullest meaning of what it means to be the mother of Jesus is only revealed when she's given away to be our mother. But the point is that the passages are connected by the presence of Mary, also connected by another literary illusion. What's vinegar? Huh? Right, it's sour wine. So the two passages are connected by the mention of wine and the presence of Mary together. Sour wine, wow. What kind of a wedding would it be where you were served sour wine as opposed to wine spectator and wine? It wouldn't be a very compelling wedding. But we're invited to think about this. Who's the true bridegroom? And when is his wedding feast? Here he is on the cross, the true bridegroom, and the origin of all wine, the true vine. Who is given vinegar to drink? He who miraculously created wine spectator when vinegar. But even more, what about the, the piercing of the side? The evangelist calls our attention to this image. Did you notice that? He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true. Why would you need an eyewitness? Probably if you stick somebody in somebody's side, something's going to come out if they just died. Something that looks like blood and water. And the evangelist chooses to describe it that way for a reason. And also, the evangelist says, this took place so that scripture may be fulfilled. So, the evangelist John is saying, pay attention to this image. This is an important image. It's one you should receive into your heart, contemplating it. The image of the open side of Jesus flowing with blood and water, the dead Jesus. Now, friends, the connection to the wedding feast of Cana prompts us to think of bridal and of wedding imagery. Anybody else in the Bible have something beautiful come out of their side while they're as good as dead? If not dead. Adam, absolutely. This is an echo, an intentional echo. This is why the Gospel writer says, pay attention to this. This is an echo of the Adam and Eve story, where Adam is cast into a deep sleep, and Eve is created from his side, his bride. So we, we're invited to think about what is, who is, coming forth from the side of Christ. The fathers of the church always interpreted this passage, the blood of the water, to be representative of the two, you could say, the most basic sacraments, the Eucharist and the blood, 
and baptism in the water. And so, by evoking those two sacraments that create the church, to evoke the church. So you see the image, the church coming forth from the side of Christ as Eve came forth from the side of Adam. And therefore, we're invited to contemplate the mystery of the church as bride, under the image of bride. And the evangelist hopes, I think, pro proclaims this so that the church over the centuries would receive this image more and more con contemplatively and be able to enter more deeply into the mystery of the church. What does it mean, in a way, to say that the church is the bride of Christ? The bride is someone who is constituted only by someone, by, by someone else's love. So there's no other meaning to the word. Bernard of Clairvaux brings this out in his homilies on the Song of Songs. A bride is someone who is beloved. So what is the image saying? What's the origin of the church, the constitution of the church? It's not the will of a bunch of people to get together. The constitution of the church is the blood of Christ, is the love of Christ. The church is born in and from that love. And always, therefore, is the presence of that love. That is way different from a club. And I think if you, if you, um, if you want to make this difference between this sort of club ecclesiology and the true ecclesiology, very graphic, you can remember this image from the Gospel of John. So the church is the bride of Christ. And to give you a text to sum this up, besides the Bible, if that weren't enough, you can look at the slide, Catechism 766. I tell my students that this is the most important article in the whole Catechism, which is a little ridiculous, maybe, because there's about 2,500 or more articles in the Catechism, so why this one? I think it's because the mystery of the church is the most misunderstood mystery of all of them. And that's a pretty high bar, since there's a lot of misunderstanding about the Trinity and other things. But, like a lot of young people are fine with Jesus, right? Jesus is fine, cool guy, whatever, but not the church. But can you actually see? And I think if you, if you have the idea of the church as a club that we made, yes, you can separate the music. You can find Jesus in other clubs. You can find his teaching, some of them, in other clubs. But if you have the image in your mind of the church as born from the pierced heart of Christ, you find it a lot harder to separate. Jesus, the mystery of his person from the church. Anyway, let's look at 766. The church is born primarily of Christ's total self given for our salvation, anticipated in the institution of the Eucharist and fulfilled on the cross. Fulfilled on the, cross. the origin and growth of the church symbolized by the blood and water which flowed from the open side of the crucified Jesus. That's a quote from Luminense. For it was from the side of Christ as he slept the sleep of death upon the cross that there came forth the wondrous sacrament of the whole church. And that's a quote from Sacrosanctum and Chilean, two documents of Vatican II, Luminense, Sacrosanctum and Chilean. As Eve was born, 
from the sleepy attic side, so the church was moved from the pierced heart of Christ hanging dead on the cross. That's a reference to an Ambrose and Ambrose's homilies on the moon. So, what's the church born of? Our desire to get together and form a club and do things? No, the church is born primarily of Christ's total self giving for our salvation. Participate in the institution of the Eucharist and fulfill that for us. That's the constitution of the church. And therefore, friends, the church becomes a mystery. But notice, what is the church a mystery of? The church is a mystery of Christ's love. The church is an independent, freestanding mystery. The church is a derivative mystery, a mystery of Christ's love. The fathers of the church used to like to use the imagery of Jesus Christ as the Son, as you and the Son. And the church is the moon. So the church shone with light, but it's reflected light. It's the light of the sun, as you met Jesus Christ. So the imagery contains the truth that the church shines with mystery. The mystery that the church shines with is the love of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ, which makes the church. You can see, you can see that St. Paul calls the nuptial union of Christ and the Church a great mystery. So this imagery is not only Jonah, it's also Paul. Because she is united to Christ as to her bridegroom, she becomes a mystery in her turn. See how that works? It's the mystery of Christ and his love is primary. But because the Church is united to Christ as to her bridegroom, she becomes a mystery in her turn. The mystery of the church is a derivative mystery. Contemplating this mystery in her, Paul exclaims, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So that's actually our fourth point. The first point being, the world was created for the sake of the church. Don't worry, we're going to circle back to that. The second point being, to try to uplift, you might say, this kind of caricature of the church that I call we the people of theology. The third point being, by contrast, the church is a mystery, a mystery that's carried in images. One of them, one of the primary ones, and deeply scriptural, is the church as bride. And therefore, fourth point, the church is a derivative mystery, a mystery of Christ's love. Like the moon, shining with light, that moon of the given self. We can move on from there to number 770. The church is in history, but at the same time she transcends it. It is only with the eyes of faith that one can see in her visible reality and at the same time in her spiritual reality as bearer of divine life. So the church, as mystery, has a visible aspect that's in history. We can see it just like Amtrak. I wouldn't advise believing it. Lot of reasons. You know, 
labor a lot of times. But, but unlike Amtrak, the church has there's more to the church than meets the eye. And friends, that, if you think about it, very deeply presents the extreme beauty of the mystery of the church. Think about it, friends. Because what is the church? The church is a communion of people that's visible. You can see the church, just like you can see Amtrak. But what binds this people together is nothing it gave itself. It isn't anything we bring to the equation. What binds this people together is the blood of Christ, the love of Christ poured out on the cross. That's what holds it together and makes the communion of the church. And of course, that's mediated to us, that love of Christ and the sacraments. But that means the church is not a human work in, in the first instance. It's the work of Christ's love. And the beauty of the church is that it really is in the world. It really is visible. You can point to it. It's composed of sinners. And yet, all of the members of the church are sinners. Except for the head, Jesus, of course, the Blessed Mother. But the miracle is that, think about it, friends. No sin of any member of the church can make void the blood of Christ that forms the church. Nothing can undo that. And so what you find in the church is the visible presence in the world binding sinners together, healing and purifying them, the visible presence in the world of that immaculate love. So when we say the church is holy, we aren't, in the first instance, making a statement about any member of the church. The church is holy because Christ's love is holy, because Christ's blood is holy, and there's nothing, nothing in the universe that can violate that purpose because it's pure love. And that's what connects us together in the church. And so we say that the church of Numagentia is at once holy, and always in need of purification. That's chapter 8 in the Magentia, number 8. So once holy, why is the church holy? Primarily, not because of anything we put in, but because of the holiness and the love of Christ that binds it together, out of which the church is born. That very love is purifying. who are always in need of purification. So when scandals arise in the church, friends, it, on the one hand, it doesn't touch the essential holiness of the church because it's not ours, right? We didn't put it in. The church is not our work. It's a sacrament of that love. On the other hand, of course, it's a scandal because all in the church are called be purified by that burning fire of love which holds us together. You know, I am. Um, I once told Bishop Darcy, God rest his soul, that I was going to form my own church. For the record, it's not advisable to tell your bishop that. <laughs> <coughs> and I had, I wasn't actually serious, but I was frustrated with a lot of things. Uh, I, I told him I was going to call it the, the River of Life Church, and I was going to set it up and whatever. I should have said it. I heard his feelings and I hadn't been to. I'm sorry I said it. But if you think about it, friends, if I were to set up a church, what would it mean to people? What would it convey? It would convey my choice to do that. And it would convey the choice of people to come together or 
wanted to join. That's all it would convey. And probably the church that I created it looked a lot like me, of course. Who wouldn't want to know? <laughs> there wouldn't be all the people left to go to Mass and see Catholics with people in New York City for instance, daily Mass. There's people lying around in the back. They wouldn't be in my church. Only people respectable and nice like me. But you know what? Christ didn't shed his blood thinking ahead. Well, this drop goes for that respectable person who's going to come later, and this drop for that very virtuous person, John C. Cavanini, of course, and a few others. Um, that's not what happened, right? Just shed his blood, plenty of potentiary all over the place for everybody without their merit, without our merit. That's what makes the church, and the church mediates that life, regardless of age, gender, sex, accomplishment, intelligence, any of those things. None of those out of the church. Only that one. So friends, the fifth point then. This leads to the way in which Lumen Gentium talks about the church in its very first chapter, the Catechism chapters in 775. The church is like a sacrament of communion with God and therefore communion among human beings. 775. The church in Christ is like a sacrament, a sign and instrument, that is, of communion with God and of unity among all human beings. What does that mean? A sacrament is something visible, always. A visible sign. But because the church is made, is created by the love of Christ, when you bump into the church in the world, you bump into the love of Christ. If you think about the people of Israel in the Old Testament, the chosen, what made them the chosen? God's election, right? God's will. And no matter what that people did, and no matter what terrible leadership they had, they had terrible leaders. There were maybe four good kings, one of them being King David, one of the good kings who, remember, had the husband of the woman that he wanted killed in order to marry her. So that's one of the virtuous kings. But because they were chosen, not because of any of their merits, nothing they did could undo that choice. The fidelity of God guaranteed it. And so when you bumped into the people of Israel, you bumped into the chosen. You bumped into God's electing will, God's choice. Same thing with the church. When you bump into the church, you bump into something she didn't give herself. The blood of Christ, the love of Christ, which forms the church. And that's the beauty of it, friends. It's right in the world. You don't have to go to another planet. You don't have to find the 12 most virtuous people. They must be the church. No, it, it's not that at all. Christ didn't die just for the 12 most virtuous people. It's everyone bound together in that, in that love which come from him. So that's what we mean, the fifth point then, when we say that the church is a sacrament, mediating that love. What about the part in this would be the sixth point? I only have seven. Don't worry. What about the, the point that says the church is like a sacrament, a sign and instrument of communion with God, unity among all men and all human beings. How is it that? Friends, think about that. What could possibly be the universal source of human 
some area. What is there that could bind all of human beings into one group, one community? There's a lot of candidates for that, right? How about nationality? It binds a lot of people into large groups, but the trouble is it creates as many differences as it creates groups. So that's, in the end, not a great, a great candidate. And if you think of anything else you can think of, actually, any human trait that you can think of is going to create as many divisions as it creates groups. If you want to do it by race, if you want to do it by gender, if you want to do it by ethnicity, if you want to do it by intelligence, to do it by work, whatever. The only thing that can bind human beings truly into one communion is a love that has no self-interest. None at all. A perfect, pure, immaculate love. And guess what? We can't give ourselves that because we don't have it. But the bridegroom, the true bridegroom, in flesh, he has no sin. And yet, he entered into solidarity with sinners. Think about the baptism of the Lord, what happens there? If I were, if Jesus had a good career coming to Maybe the good career counselor would have said, don't jump in that water. Do you see who went in that water? Did you see that? A tax collector. Tax collectors were extortionists. They were the scum of the Jewish people because they collaborated with Romans to extort Roman taxes. And how did they get paid? They didn't have a salary. They got paid by as much excess as they could collect over the tax which they had to give to the Romans. People hated them. That's what came to the Baptists. And prostitutes, did you see that? If you jump in that water, people are going to think you're one of them. They're going to think that you're a sinner. But the actual word made flesh doesn't listen to the good career counsel. He jumps right in the water. He doesn't care. He enters into solidarity as though he were a sinner, though he wasn't. And he never breaks it, right? Even when they tempted him to come down from the cross. At that point, I would have said, I would have thrown it in. If I were the word made flesh. Yeah, I'm done. I'm not a sinner, so get me off this cross. I'm coming down because I don't deserve to die. I don't have a penalty for sin. But he didn't. He really joined us. And so, at the point of his death, he recreated human suffering in that love, which was willing to save we with all of us who are sinners. And now we can, we can say we in his love. That's the source of human suffering, and the only possible one. That complete self emptying love. When we're connected by that love in Him, we're truly in communion. So friends, you can see now why we're circling back. It says, the world was created for the sake of the church. Why? Because the church is communion in that self-giving, utterly selfless love which has no vested interest. And when we're bound in that love, we're bound as intimately as we can be to each other, regardless of whether we like the person next to us in church or not. The church was, the world was created for the sake of that community. And isn't it interesting to think that, that heaven 
is the church. The church perfected, but it is the church. It is that communion in Christ's love perfected. So friends, all the way to heaven is heaven. Participating now in the life of the church is participating in advance in the life of heaven. Think about it. Anyway, to go back to the world that was created for the sake of the church, you can see now that it can only be true if it's reversible. The church was created for the sake of the world, right? Because the church, the sacrament of that communion, of the only communion which can bind us together, is created for the world, for its destiny, for its communion, ultimately. So it's only true that the world was created for the sake of the church. If it's reversible, the church was created for the sake of the and I bring that up as my last point, the seventh point. Because I think, friends, sometimes people think, well, if I love the church, it means I don't love the world, right? I'm separating myself from the world because I'm loving the church, so I'm getting all introspective. And Pope Francis has often talked about um, the church not looking inward so much. But it's not true. Think about it. What is the love of the bridegroom that makes the church? In the Gospel of John it says, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son. So the church making love, the love that makes the church, is that very same love which orders us to love the world. The love of the church is the sacrament of the love of the world. And I have a final passage out here. I think it's one of the most gorgeous passages ever written by a poet. Is that a low bar? It's, <laughs> it's a really beautiful passage. It comes from, from Pius XII's encyclical Mystici Corpus, Mystic Body. It's number 96 and 97. I'm sorry, the numbers are not there. In this section, in this section, as he's closing the encyclical of Pius XII, he's talking about love of the church. What is, what is the authentic love of the church? And in my view, this is something we have to teach now. What is love of the church? In order to guard against the gradual weakening, weakening of that sincere love, which requires us to see our Savior in the Church and in its members, it is most fitting that we should look to Jesus himself as the perfect model of love for the Church. And first of all, let us imitate the breadth of his love. For the Church, the bride of Christ is one, and yet so vast is the love of the, is the, love of the divine spouse, the bride, that it embraces in his bride whole human race without exception. Our Savior shed his blood precisely in order that he might reconcile men to God from the cross, and might constrain them to unite in one body, however widely they may differ in nationality and race. See, the question of what's the true source of human unity. True love of the church, therefore, requires not only that we should be mutually solicitous one for another as members, sharing in their suffering. But likewise that we should recognize that other men, although they are not yet joined to us in the body of the church, our brothers in Christ according to the flesh, called together with us to the same eternal salvation. It is true, unfortunately, especially today, this was written in the height of the Nazi atrocities during World War II, that there are some who extol enmity, hatred, and spite as if they enhance the dignity and worth of man. Let us, however, while we look with sorrow on the disastrous consequences of this teaching, follow our peaceful King, who taught us to love not only those who are of a different nation and race, but even our enemies. While our heart over 
hearts those with the sweetness of the teaching of the Apostle of the Gentiles, Paul. We extol with him the length and the breadth and the height and the depth of the charity of Christ, which neither diversity of race or customs can diminish, nor trackless waste of the ocean breaking, nor wars whether just or unjust destroy. I think that's absolutely the case. But the point is, love, authentic love of the church, is love of the love that made the church. And that love is poured out for love of the world. So our love of the church orders us and is a sacrament of love of the world. Anyway, friends, that's my last one.